ಸದಿದೇವ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಕವವಯ್ಯನನ್ನು ಕರುಣಾಲವಾಲ ದೇವಾದಿ ದೇವ ಈ ವೇಳೆ ಈ ವೇಳೆ ಅರುಚತ್ರುಲನು ಈ ವೇಳೆ ಅರುಚತ್ರುಲನು ನೀವೇ ಪರಾತ್ರೋಲಿ ನಿಜ ಜೇಸಿ ನೀವೇ ಪರಾತ್ರೋಲಿ ನಿಜ ಜೇಸಿ ದೇವಾದಿ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಕವವಯ್ಯನನ್ನು ಕರುಣಾಲವಾಲ ದೇವಾದಿ ದೇವ ನೇಚೇಸಿನ ಭೂಜಾಪಲಮು ನೇಚೇಸಿನ ಭೂಜಾಪಲಮು ನಾಜುವಜಿಯ ಪುಣ್ಯ ಫಲಮು ನೇಚೇಸಿನ ಭೂಜಾಪಲಮು ನಾಯುರ್ವಜಿಯ ಪುಣ್ಯ ಫಲಮು ಶ್ರೀ ಜಾನಕಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಜಾನಕಿ ಈ ಜನ್ಮ ಮಿಲ್ಚಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಜಾನಕಿ ಈ ಜನ್ಮ ಮಿಲ್ಚಿ ನಾನು ತಂಜು ನೀಕ ಪೂವಿ ಜೈವಿ ದೀವೆ ನಾನು ತಂಜು ನೀಕ ಪೂವಿ ಜೈವಿ ದೀವೆ ದೇವಾದಿ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಕವವಯ್ಯನನ್ನು ಕರುಣಾಲವಾಲ ದೇವಾದಿ ದೇವ ಸೊ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ನೋಲ್ ಶೇಖ್ ಎಸ್ ಜೆ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಬಾಂಬೆ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಮುಂಬೈ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ರಿಮೈಂಡ್ ಮೈ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆಫ್ professor of indian and asian religions in the department of interreligious studies at st xavier college he also teaches at uh, pune at the gyan no the gyana vidya deep vidya peet uh, pontifical institute of philosophy and religion in pune he has been uh, studying the bhagavata purana for many decades Uh, your first book uh, was called The Divinity of Krishna. It's been a kind of groundbreaking work, I would say, in comparative study of the Bhagavata, the Hari Vamsha, another text that tells the story of Krishna, and also uh, of the Vishnu Purana. Uh, the Bhagavata Purana is seems to be a kind of culmination of these three would you say that's the case yes very much so very much so in in what's a, a culmination in various respects uh, first of all on the point of view of bringing out the deeper and even mystical meaning of many of the episodes in the life of krishna they have brought out much more beautifully and more deeply in the bhagavata purana compared to the vishnu purana and the hari vamsha so that is one you know development that has taken place in the bhagavata purana and many of the episodes i find you know uh, besides narrating the episode it makes a certain uh, suggestions and even explicit statements to bring out the richer and deeper meaning which therefore does not only uh influence our minds but uh, touches our hearts moves our spirits so to me it is a deeply religious text and a text which is meant for transformation mm. transformation of oneself and transformation of society and also of nature so it's a it's a holistic transformation that i find in the bhagavata purana would you say that this is a reason why the bhagavata has endured through the ages uh, 
the thousand or more years of its existence that it's still yes. of interest? This is certainly one of the reasons. I, I find many other reasons, and I'm speaking spontaneously because yes, you didn't warn fine. me for what you're going to ask me about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, another reason why the Bhagavata is really so popular is that it has got this ability, or it has in itself, something that I see in myself, it's not only as an individual, but you know, as a particular person belonging to a tradition. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from the Hindu side, okay, a particular tradition, say the Chaitanya tradition, or the Vallabha tradition, or the Madhva tradition, and so on, or even Advaita tradition of Vallabhacharya. Mm -hmm. uh, each one of these traditions uh, finds each one of themselves in the text. Mm. So it's just like the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita also speaks to people of different traditions. So many commentators like Shankaracharya wrote a commentary, mm. Ramanuja wrote a commentary, Madhava wrote a commentary and so on. And each one of them finds something there in the Bhagavad Gita which they find within their own tradition. Mm. So in that sense it's not you know, something that interests and makes people attracted to the Bhagavata because of only one particular stream. It has many things there together. Yes. So as a result, you know, different traditions are attracted to it. This mm -hmm. is another reason to use the Sanskrit terms. The Bhagavata is, if you like, the bimba mm -hmm. and these traditions are the various Pratibimbas, you know, reflecting okay, different reflection. aspects yeah. of that you know, original one which is reflected in different ways in these things. It's not that it is refracted so much, but there are elements there which correspond to the later developments in these traditions. Mm. And therefore, each one of them can claim the Bhagavata <laughs> as their scripture, mm -hmm. their best scripture. Yes. The Without any contradiction against the other group. The term bimba, of course, meaning image, pratibimba yes. meaning yes. reflection. Reflection, yes. yes. Speaking of identification, different traditions, if we go a step further, considering that you are yourself uh, a Jesuit of the Roman Catholic tradition, can one say that it extends even that far that Christians may find something in the Bhagavata mm. that, that resonates with yes. their yes. Uh, vision? Yes, well, uh, yeah, very much so, very much so. Uh, but uh, to, to qualify, not to follow, but to precede this, you know, to uh. preface it, to yeah. preface it, uh, I remember when I was studying there at Harvard, uh, Professor Daniel Ingalls was my guide. Yes. And he, of course, he knew that I was a priest, a Jesuit. Yeah. And he asked me once, he says, uh, uh, how, how do you look at these, uh, you know, uh, various uh, stories uh, which are so erotic, you know, in the Bhagavata Purana? I mean, as a, as a priest and as a Jesuit. So I said, I have no problem with it. We also have that in our Christian tradition, you know, in the St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross. And I have written about these things also in some of my articles. Not at that time, but later on. Yeah. So uh, that was a question that you know that he put to me at that <laughs> time, which is uh, similar to your question, but yours yeah. is a broader question. So, but uh, in some of the articles that I have written, I have pointed out how we Christians can learn certain things from the Bhagavata. Mm -hmm. like one of them is the Vatsalya Bhakti, mm -hmm. the Devotion towards God, not as the son or daughter of God, but as the parent of God, mm. the father or the mother of God. This is a what seems like a radical reversal yes, of what we usually think reversal. of in the Christian. Church. Yes, yes, yes. And I have written saying that you know we also have a devotion in Christianity to the child Jesus. Yes. There is a very famous place in Prague, 
Yes, I've been there. I had the, the, <laughs> the infant Jesus there. Yes. I've been there to that place. Yeah. But that same infant Jesus, shown as an infant, okay, has a crown on his head and the whole globe, the whole yes. world in his hand. Yeah. And our carols, you know, that we sing at Christmas time are uh, singing to the baby Jesus, but the words do not give that message. The, the words are, come let us adore, mm. as in the Latin carol, yes. uh, which exists in English and other languages also, yeah. venite adoremus, mm. come let us adore. Yes. So we go down on our knees. So this kind of bhakti, or relationship of devotion is like the servant to the master or the Lord relationship. Yeah. You can also have a, you know, a relationship which is not between a higher and a lower person or an equal person, that is a Sakya relationship right. of friendship. Yes. So people are on both levels and the same. Yeah. <coughs> and we can also have the lover beloved relationship, which I said we also have in Christianity. The song of songs. The song of songs, yes. But this particular devotion of considering God as our child is present to some extent in Spain and the countries that were colonized by Spain. Oh. Yeah. The Spanish word for the baby is Nino. Ah. And they have the special feast. And so they have lullabies to ah. put the baby Jesus to sleep. Oh, okay. But for most of the rest of Christianity, we don't have that at all. Yeah. So now, but you know, when the Krishna Jayanti comes, the birthday of Krishna, uh, similarly for others also, yes. like uh, Ram Navmi, Krishna's birthday. birthday, Krishna's birthday, we have lullabies being sung to the baby Jesus who is being mm. swung around I mean, from left to right, left to right, people are pulling the string and putting the baby Krishna to sleep. Yeah. But you know, it's something very appropriate for Christians because we are also celebrating the birth of the baby Jesus. God did not become an adult. Yeah. God became a baby, <laughs> a baby who is kissable, yes. lovable, who is helpless, needs to be protected, even to be taken to Egypt and so on and so forth. Right. Okay. But somehow we don't have this parental That's love. Missed. We miss it. So you're one brain. of the things we can learn from yeah. the Bhagavata Purana. <laughs> That's very nice. And another dimension in the same line okay. is the emphasis on emotion. Mm -hmm. The Bhagavata Purana is filled, filled with emotion. And you, we see that not only in Krishna's behavior, but especially in the devotees. Uh, this afternoon, uh, was it this morning? Yeah, this morning, somebody had a talk on Uddhava, okay, and uh, the gopis. Yeah. And we are very much accustomed to the emotional reaction of the gopis, you know, who run, rush out when they hear the flute of of uh, Krishna sometimes you know, not even fully clothed you know or the, the cooking pot is still there and the you know, food is getting you know overcooked but they are rushing out okay but all that we are aware of but we don't think of some others even men who are filled with emotion in the Bhagavata Purana and one of them is, is Uddhava, Uddhava. Yeah. so before Krishna comes one of the uh, you know parts in the Bhagavata before Krishna comes he, he is waiting with excitement mm. And his head is on end. <laughs> and yes. when Krishna comes, his voice is choked. He just can't talk. Yes. So, I mean, you can see the emphasis on emotion. Yes. Tremendous emphasis on emotion. Yes. And that kind of emotion is present in Christianity in certain groups which we call charismatic groups. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of uh, emotional build-up. <coughs> they hold hands, they sing, they shout, and even they <laughs> fall down and so on yes. and so forth. But most of our Christian devotion is very placid. This is a Bhagavad Gita type of devotion. Ah, yes. You know, like, like platonic. Intellectual bhakti. Intellectual bhakti, exactly. <laughs> but bhakti is something that comes from the heart. Yes. Another passage I remember in the Bhagavata, if I'm not mistaken, yes, it is in the Bhagavata. A man, you know, is on the streets and he's in his dhoti, you know, the traditional Indian dress. So he's in his dhoti and he's telling people, you know, Look here, man, I love, I love Krishna, I love Krishna, I love <laughs> Krishna. He's mad, mad. A man is doing that. <laughs> okay. Well, even on the gopis who are talking to the 
grass and the trees and yes. so on, you know, and they where are missing. Where, where, where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? <laughs> where is Krishna? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a wonderful thing, you know, that we Christians can adopt and can learn to enrich our Christianity, to make our Christianity something that is vibrant. Mm. Wonderful. Today you spoke about the commentarial tradition mm -hmm. and especially about techniques of interpretation. Um, you went through several sorts of techniques and you, you brought out how commentators sometimes will enrich, we may say, the meaning of the text by their, what I think would be called exegesis. Uh, and perhaps you could just say a, a few words. You, you can't tell all that you told, but uh, just something about that especially in connection with the notion of the popularity of the text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the context of popularity, I already mentioned that the Bhagavata, you know, uh, evokes an interest in different traditions. Okay? And so when they look at a particular text, which uh, at least as that particular text stands, does not vibrate with their own particular tradition, the way it has developed later on, of course, after the Bhagavata. Like, for example, uh, Krishna being called an incarnation or avatar, and that also not a full avatar, but a partial avatar. Okay? Whereas in their understanding, especially in those who are believing in Krishna as a supreme being, for them, the Krishna is not, not even an avatar, yeah. but is God Avatari. himself, an avatarin, yes, yeah. from whom the other avatars emerge or yeah. evolve or come out. So, uh, they have another text which I also referred to, that Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. Yes. Okay? So, they catch on to that, but they have to also explain these other texts. Yes. Okay? And how to make sense out of it. Yeah. Okay? Of course, it is a later development in their tradition. In other words, it means that no, there is a development in the religion, even scripturally. This is what I've shown in my book on Krishna, that there is development theologically yeah. of our understanding of Krishna. It does not mean, you know, this has been projected into Krishna, but right. it means how people began to understand Krishna more deeply, more deeply and mm -hmm. more, you know, uh, eloquently and more sort of uh, eminently, put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, than they understood in the earlier texts. Right. So from that point of view, uh, I don't mean therefore you know that they were concocting things. I mean that they are discovering things. Yeah. Okay. But in that discovery, okay, there is an enrichment that takes place. Yeah. So within that context, they use their grammatical and other skills, yeah. okay, to construe to connect one word, not with the word which one would normally think of connecting it, yeah. but with something else also there in that text. Okay? Yes. And, and bring out a, a completely different meaning where you see that Krishna is not, not a part or not an, you know, an avatar. And the nature of Sanskrit is such that it facilitates that. It facilitates that. that. It facilitates yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Facilities. Of course, there are other techniques where they add something else and yes. so on. Interpret a particular, say, an ablative, as I pointed out, as an instrumental case yeah. and so on. So, but as I was telling somebody after the, our session, I do believe that they are doing it not only for the sake of justifying their own tradition, which is a good cause, but some of the gym gymnastics that they do, hmm. uh, when I write up the paper, I will, will have time more to bring yeah. out that much more. Yes. So I didn't have the time because I had to Obviously. jump to other ones. Yeah. But the way they do it, I feel that they take joy in being able to do that. Yes, yeah. that's a kind so of it's, acrobatics. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not just from the perspective of, of uh, you know, explaining away the text so that it does not, you know, to, it doesn't appear to be against what they are holding. Yeah. That is one of the things, of course. But on the other hand, uh, 
it's also the joy of being able to do it. And that's <laughs> yeah. the beauty yeah. of the Sanskrit language. Yes. You've mentioned two or three times the word avatara, mm -hmm. and it occurs to me that sometimes we translate that word, or we mistranslate it, depending mm -hmm. how you see, as incarnation. Mm -hmm. And I know that in Christian theology, uh, there's a very strong understanding that incarnation applies only to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that uh, he is the incarnation, and so there's perhaps some resentment mm -hmm. uh, with the notion of translating the word avatara uh, with that word. And I think it was, what was his name, Parangar? forget. Uh, someone wrote an entire book on this subject, mm -hmm. Avatar and Incarnation, mm -hmm. a few decades mm -hmm. ago. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Well, I have written a long article on this. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is one of, my, one of my very good articles, which has been printed originally in the United States <coughs> in the, what is it called, uh, uh, Philosophy East and West. Oh. It's a journal of comparative philosophy. Yeah. So it came out first there, but it has been reprinted in many European languages oh. and also reprinted in India and other places well, that's in a English. Sign of a successful yeah. article. Yes, yes, <laughs> very much so, very much so. So, I mean, I can go on and on, on speak on, on and on on this particular topic, <laughs> but to say a few things in this particular context, first of all, there are a lot of similarities in the idea of what is called avatara and uh, the incarnation, where you know, there is an emphasis being given to not something that is far away, transcendent, but something that is, you know, has descended. That's a little etymologically yeah. the Avatar. meaning of the word avatar, avatar. has descended, yeah. you know, come down to our level. And therefore, evokes, a, you know, a relationship that is uh, more intimate mm. than with something who is uh, far away. Mm. Something like, you know, in the Trinitarian understanding of the Christian tradition, there is the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, who is the distant God, because God the Father does not become incarnate. He mm. is the second person who becomes incarnate right. as Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so I mean, the Holy Spirit does not become incarnate. Mm. So when Christians pray, they pray of course to the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, but most of the time they are praying to Jesus Christ mm. because the second person became incarnate and yeah. we feel more at home with him, yes. the one of us. So that also is there in the avatar understanding. And then of course there's a sense of value is given to the world because God becomes incarnate in the world. So these are just a few examples of similarities. Okay. But then there are also differences on account of which we can learn from one another. So for example, there are many incarnations or many descents mm. in the Hindu Vaishnava tradition coming again and again. That makes sense because it is a cyclic worldview. But on the other hand, in Christianity, it's a linear worldview. Everything is moving to a final goal. There is no repetition. And therefore it makes sense to have only one incarnation. Right. Yes. But I have gone into subtleties. So I have also referred to St. Thomas Aquinas, mm. who says long ago now, that it is possible that God can incarnate many times. Oh, oh. This is very much, so in other words, what St. Thomas Aquinas is holding on the level of possibility, right. Hinduism or Vaishnavism is holding on the level of <laughs> actuality. <laughs> yes. okay. So he is not, therefore, it is, in other words, it is not uh, against the grain for a Christian to think that it is possible, as St. Thomas Aquinas says that, that one can have many incarnations. Yeah. So he says not only that the second person actually became incarnate, but the first person and the third person could also become incarnate in many, you know, forms, or could all three become incarnate in one form. Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas. So that brings the two Very much ideas together. together. Yes. You know, one is on the level of possibility, but yeah. not denied. Yeah. And the other is on the level of, of actuality. I suspect that many. Roman Catholics are not aware of this. Yes, many Roman Catholics are not aware of this. Yes, that's very true. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, there are a lot of other things like, you know, in the Hindu tradition, the social 
uh, dimension was not given so much emphasis as in Christianity. Yeah. Okay? But so the incarnation brings out that aspect as it has been developed in the theology. Yeah. So the Hindus can learn from Christianity on that yes. aspect. Okay? Mm -hmm. But then we also can learn because in nowadays, especially in modern Christian theology, you know, we have the understanding that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, the human nature and divine nature. Yes. Okay? But there are some modern Christian theologians who keep this formula, but they say that Jesus Christ was a human person okay, who was divinized mm. and therefore has now two natures, divine and human nature. Oh, so then okay, so the, the formula is kept, one person, mm. two natures. Mm. Okay? So, it's a kind of ascending thing there. Right. Whereas the traditional understanding is that God descends, so he's already a divine person, okay, but then takes on a human nature. Okay, so therefore he has is one person, two natures. So even in this later development, one person, two natures. <laughs> but it's a completely different understanding for the orthodox tradition. Okay? So now Hinduism which emphasizes the divinity of Krishna, mm. even as an avatar, because he, as a theology develops, not in the text, but as a theology develops, Krishna is only pretending to be hungry, pretending to be thirsty, so that his foster mother Yashoda would practice the parental devotion. Mm. Okay? And so even after revealing himself, he hides himself so that they will no more think of that divinity aspect but think of the parental aspect. Yes. Okay? So, but primordially the, the Bhagavata wants to emphasize the divinity of Krishna. Yes. It reminds us that we may be forgetting the divinity of Jesus Mm. by humanizing him too much. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I have written extensively on this. Yeah, I'll have to read your article. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll send you the reference. Thank you. <laughs> so, Professor Shea, thank you so much. Thank you for coming, for spending all the time Most to welcome. come here Most to uh, present in the conference. And thank you for, for sharing these thoughts with us today. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you.